Turn to Luke 10. As I mentioned before, two-part sermon between this morning and this evening. I was feeling a little bit bogged down in Ecclesiastes, and so I thought it would be good to break things up a little bit, and this was a perfect message to do so as we head into these summer months. Things get warm, start seeing your neighbors again, start out doing things, going to parks, being around other people a little bit more, people are outside, more interaction. And it, it's a good time to remember that we have a job to do. It's a good time to remember that God has placed us here for a reason. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus has, in Luke 9, at the beginning of Luke 9, He commissioned His 12 disciples to go. He sent them out two by two, His apostles, and they went out and they did wonders in His name. And they preached the gospel of the kingdom, and they cast out demons, and then they came back to him again. We're going to see a similar circumstance today. This time it's not going to be just 12 that go out, but 70 followers of Jesus that go out. And through it we're going to, we're going to find a very similar account in some ways to what we learned about in Luke 9, if, for those of you that come on Sunday evenings. But we're also going to find some differences and we're going to highlight those differences, and it's going to draw us into a deeper understanding of exactly uh, what Jesus was telling the 70, how it applies to the 12, how it applies to the 70, and then how it applies to us today and the commission which we have of the Lord. So as I mentioned, this is going to be a two-parter. We're not going to get through all of this this morning, but let's begin in verse 1 of Luke chapter 10 where the Bible says this, After these things the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So rather than only sending the twelve to go and preach, as we read here, Jesus appoints seventy. These seventy are called other seventy also, which would lead us to believe that it's probably not including the twelve apostles, but is an entirely different group of seventy Followers, And what a blessing it is to see and to know that Jesus felt comfortable commissioning another 70 people to go and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That means that there were at least this, this group of 70 who were truly devoted, as we talked about in Luke chapter 9. Those who had picked up their cross to follow him. Those who had left all and, and went to preach the gospel. As a matter of fact, uh, I would wonder if maybe, if you recall last week in Luke 9, as uh, one man said, Jesus, I will follow you whithersoever you will go. But first, right, and, and we, we see these, these excuses, right? The first man says, I'll follow you. And Jesus says, well, the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And then the second, Jesus says, you follow me. And the man says, first, let me go bury my father. And he says, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and preach the gospel. And then the third says, I will follow you, but first let me go say goodbye to my family. And Jesus says, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looked back, is fit for the kingdom, is useful, is ready to be used for the kingdom. And so here we find 70 people that have been called, have answered that call, and are ready to go and preach the gospel. Jesus is now duplicating the commission he gave to the twelve, with the other 70, feeling that they were ready to do this work. And he sends them, the Bible says, to places where he himself would go, but which time would perhaps prevent him as he's now coming into the final months before death. Jesus had things to do. He had places to go. He was heading toward uh, Jerusalem. He was going in that direction, and there were many places yet to go, but he didn't have time to do them all. He's only one man. He can only do so much. And so now he's sending them out to go to the places where he was not able Presumably, going out two by two, if they were all sent to a different city, he could hit 35 cities in about the same time that it would take them, him and his 12, to normally address one city. And that's the power of the collective. That's the power of a group of people saying, we are going to go out and we are going to do the work. So whereas one man might be able to talk to 10 people, 10 people could talk to 100 and then we have the ability through the collective to reach far more people than one man could ever do. Now we'll see over the next several verses that this is very similar. 
This passage is very similar to what we read at the beginning of the previous chapter in Luke 9. But there are a few notable differences. And we're going to spend our time focusing on some of those differences as we walk through the next several verses. We'll also draw the parallels between the two. So Jesus first recognizes the need for them to go. And this is our memory work for the month. Jesus recognizes the need for them to go because the work is great and there are people that are ready to hear. So we read in verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So Jesus makes this statement to these 70 men and he tells them the harvest is great. In Matthew 9.37, in the parallel passage to this, he uses the word plenteous. The harvest truly is plenteous. There is much there. The harvest is ready. The fields are white unto harvest. The concept of white fields is an agricultural term. At the end of the season, when the wheat has come to full maturity and is ready to be harvested, the tops lighten considerably and they look almost white on the tops. There's almost like a, almost looks like a white film on the top. This is the time that the farmer knows that the field is ready to be harvested. And this is the concept that Jesus is, alluring, uh, is alluding to. That Jesus looked at the world around him and he saw men and women that were ready to be harvested. Now this is not just ready to hear the gospel, but ready to receive the gospel. Jesus will talk about this and we'll get into this a little bit later in John 4. He'll say that there are some people that plant and there are some people that harvest. And the sower and the, and the reaper, they, they, will, they will rejoice together on the day of judgment because of the people that have both been sown and then reaped. So there are some that sow the gospel. There are some that reap the gospel. In the case of these cities, Jesus looked at all of those cities and he said, the harvest is great. The fields are ready. They are white unto harvest. There are people that are ready if only there was someone to tell them. If only there was someone to tell them. So he sends the 70 into the cities around him because he couldn't be everywhere at once. And there are people that are ready, if they will hear the gospel, they are ready to receive it with gladness. So Jesus commissions others to help him do the work. But the fact that the fields were white unto harvest was more or less simply a statement of fact, right? The fields are white unto harvest, that's a fact. And then he gives a second fact. The laborers are few. There are not enough Laborers. There are more people ready to hear than there are laborers willing to tell. There are more people that are ready to accept the gospel than there are people to harvest them. Than there are people to lead them unto the gospel. And so then Jesus gives his command. And he says this to them. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. He says, because the fields are white unto harvest, pray the Lord to send forth laborers. The crop is there, waiting to be harvested, but there aren't enough people to harvest. Jesus is only one man. The apostles are only 12. Jesus needed more. And he chose 70. But you know, those 70 were not nearly enough either. And so Jesus says, pray. Pray that the Lord would send forth laborers. But may I make a point here, and, and, and we'll highlight it again a little bit later. May I, may I make a point that Jesus was not just telling them to pray, right? And we know this because this is their commissioning. Which means he was telling them to pray while they were also going. This was not just them, you sit at home on the couch and pray with the potato chips in your hand. This is, you are going, and also pray for more. This was not Jesus giving them an excuse not to go, because you can just pray. This was Jesus saying, while you're doing your part, pray that others would do theirs as well. But then take note of the, the warning in the next verse. He says in verse 3, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. He says, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. It doesn't sound very fair, does it? The commission to tell is not a commission that is without danger, that is without suffering, that is without persecution. 
the harvest field into which the laborers were sent was not just a benign harvest field. It was not just a bunch of grain. It was a bunch of grain that was surrounded with, by wolves and, and filled with wolves. But as it was in Luke 9, so too it is in Luke 10. Jesus tells them, yes, there are wolves. But you know what? You don't have to worry about them. And here's why you don't have to worry about them. Verse 4. He says, carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Here's where we begin to look at the comparisons between chapter 10 and then previously in chapter 9. In chapter 9, we see a very similar commission that they would take with them for their journey. Neither stave nor script, neither bread, neither money not even to have two coats apiece. He tells them to carry nothing with them, nothing of value, no backup plan, that they don't need to worry about their own provision, but rather trust that God will provide for them along the way. He continues in verse 10, and he says, And into whatsoever house she enter, first say, Peace be to this house. So always go in with a right expectation. Don't go in with, with the... Don't go in defensively. Go in... Do the ministry with an expectation of conferring peace. Peace be to this house. And there abide if they allow you to abide. Luke 10 then continues in a similar vein to that which we considered in Matthew. In Luke 9, we went to the Matthew passage to fill in a few of the gaps. Uh, these gaps are, are um, similar to what we find in Luke chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. He says, and in the same house, this house where you leave your peace, if they will receive you and you leave your peace there, in the same house uh, uh, remain eating and drinking such as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house and into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So this is the prescription, right? They are to go and I hope that you can see the parallels to, to, to giving the gospel. They are to go and they're, they're, they're supposed to go with optimism. You confer peace upon the household and if they allow you to remain, then you stay there. Then you allow them and, and this would be for the minister, you allow them to bless you and you don't command of them or demand of them expectations. If they let you stay, you stay. Whatever they feed you, you eat. Right? Missionaries have to contend with that one. Uh, the old missionary prayer, right? Lord, I'll get it down if you keep it down. That kind of an idea. Who knows what it is that they're going to be feeding you, but praise the Lord, you're getting fed. They're providing for you. And so go there. Eat what they, what's set before you. And while you're there, then do the work of the ministry. Don't go from house to house. Choose a base of operation and then use that to fan out. Heal the sick. And say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. The kingdom of God, the gospel of peace is here and I have it and I'm giving that to you. That's their commission. There's a physical part, there's a spiritual part. Go, allow them to help you, allow them to bless you, and then you give them the spiritual. Continuing in verses 10 and 11. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not... Go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Like before, we talked about uh, many weeks ago in Luke 9, so too again. Jesus tells them, if no one in the city is willing, if, if you go and you start preaching the gospel and nobody says, hey, come stay in my house. You have no base of operation. Not, not, no one in the city receives you. Well, then leave that city. It says, shake the dust off your feet. The idea there being, I'm not even going to, uh, I've done my part and now I'm not even going to fret about, the, <laughs> I'm not even going to take the dust of your city with me. I'm not going to take anything of you with me. You're off of my conscience because I've done my best and you've rejected me. That's the idea. And then he said, and say this to them, of this you can be sure, city, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. It came close. Like the meteor that passes by earth, but doesn't hit it. It came, but then it moved on. The kingdom of God came, the gospel of Christ came, and you saw it, and it was close, and we were right here, and you rejected us, and now we're moving past you. We're moving on. You've missed your chance. And this, is, this uh, 
rejection Jesus continues to speak of in verses 12 and following. And that's what we're going to consider tonight. We're going to dig into the, the nature of rejection. The first half of this, verses 1 through 11, Jesus was focused, focusing in on, the, uh, on those that he commissioned, on his disciples. This is how his disciples should act. This is what his disciples should do. The second half of this is Jesus focusing in on those who have heard, those who would hear, those who would reject and the nature of rejection. So we'll talk about that tonight. That's where we finish our exposition for part one, however, in verse 11. And as we uh, complete this exposition, let's dig into a couple of important application points. Now, I trust that the Holy Spirit has already been using the Word of God as we've walked through it to apply things to your heart as you think of your own ministry, as you think of your, your own need to go, as you think of the people that you have an opportunity to tell. And I know that it's a difficult thing in this age. People are not predisposed to share the gospel. And it's getting worse and worse and worse through the problem that is the impersonal nature of the digital age. We're becoming farther and farther removed from our neighbors. We're becoming farther and farther removed from actual, meaningful social interaction. And then when you chalk up the fact that we are a fairly conservative Christian group, then we also are careful through separation to not get too close to those who are unbelievers. And that can create even, far, even more distance. But may I encourage you, we need to be telling others of the gospel. We need to be finding ways to, to, to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are some ways in the past that don't work anymore and we have to think of new ways. There are other things that have been done in the past that are still working well and, and, and maybe we can use them. But one way or another, we need to be out sharing the gospel. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But point number one is we apply. The fields are white. The laborers are few. Will you pray knowing the master of the harvest. There are only a few things in the scriptures that the Bible explicitly commands us to pray for. There are actually fairly few considering how important prayer is and how pervasive prayer is supposed to be in our lives. In the Sermon on the Mount, we have what is somewhat erroneously called the Lord's Prayer. It's more like a model prayer. But in it, Jesus does not say to pray this as much as he says, pray after this manner. And Jesus calls us to ask and seek and knock for good gifts, but there are only a couple of times in Scripture where the Bible actually says, pray this. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So the Bible tells us that we are to be praying for those that are in authority, for all of our authorities, and for all men specifically, right? It says supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks for all men. So we do this for all, and then we particularly heighten the prayer, excuse me, for rulers. And the point that Paul is making here is this. That you want believing rulers, because if your rulers will accept Christ, if they will be saved, then you will have great peace in your time. If they are willing to accept even the, the general tenets of, of the gospel, if they're willing to even just let you do your thing as far as the gospel is concerned, and if they're willing just to let you serve the Lord in good conscience, then you're going to be in a pretty good place. And so the Bible commands us to pray for authorities. This is why every week I, we, we pray for government here. This is why every week we pray for our president and Congress and, and our, our governor and mayor and all, all of those. We pray for them because the Lord would have all men to be saved. And he specifically says, pray for men, for kings and all that are in authority. So we do so. And we would earnestly desire that the Lord would uh, answer those prayers with giving us peace in our time. That we might, in sincerity and simplicity, continue to worship, the God, uh, worship our God in freedom. James 1, 5 and 6. James says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So James tells us that one of the things that we ought to be praying for is wisdom. When we understand that we lack wisdom in any particular circumstance, we are to pray for wisdom. James 5, 13 to 15. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. 
Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So James also tells us to pray a prayer of faith for those who are sick, asking the Lord to heal. It's explicitly commanded. Now, on top of these, and then we have this one in, in uh, Luke chapter 10. On top of these, we have things that are commanded in regard to what to pray or how to pray. Excuse me. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. 1 Timothy 2.8 tells us to pray everywhere. 1 John 5.14 tells us to ask according to the will of God. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.1, among many others, tells us to pray for the ministers that are among us. But compared to the role of prayer that is supposed to be in a Christian's life, where, wherein we are supposed to pray without ceasing, really what? We, we've only encountered four particular passages where the Bible says, pray this, five I guess, if we include this one. Pray this prayer. And this is one of those commands, that we would pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, what we know about prayer in the Bible is that the purpose of prayer is not to inform God of, of our needs, right? It's not to inform God of anything. We know this from Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. God knows our needs. We do not pray in order to inform God of our needs. That being said, however, this does not by any means imply that prayer is useless or that it doesn't have any effect. And so we can divide prayer into two common categories. And I'm just going to go off on prayer for just a moment before we get back into evangelism because I want us to understand what Jesus is actually commanding us to do here. And the point, the purpose with which God commands us to do it. So the, these two general categories of prayer, and I, I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit, uh, but prayer can be generally categorized into prayer for that which Christ has promised and prayer for that which we desire. Now, we can divide prayer in many different ways, how to pray, uh, what, what's the content of our prayers. Uh, I've taught before on the idea of, of the, the um, acts or actsy that as you use each one of the, the letters in A-C-T-S-I as an acronym, you can say, well, what should I pray at any given time? A, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication. I, intercession. And so we, those are some ways that in any given prayer time, we ought to be praying. We ought to first confess our sin, because if we regard the iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. And then we ought to spend some time adoring and thanking our Lord. We ought not just think of him as the divine Santa Claus in the sky to give us what we want, but we need to recognize that he is our Lord and that he has done great things for us. And it's worthy of our time, and certainly the Lord is worthy, to receive that praise. And then we bring our supplications and our intercessions. We pray for the things that we need, for the things we desire, and we intercede on behalf of others, on behalf of our family, on behalf of our friends, on behalf of, of the wayward, on behalf of those who are not wayward. We intercede for them. And so th those are some different ways that we can pray. But as we think about the categories of prayer, I've broken it up into these two ideas, that we pray for that which Christ has promised, and we pray for that which we desire. In each case, we are called to pray unto similar results. And those similar results are first, submission to God's perfect will, and second, seeking the actual result for which we ask. So in the model prayer, we talked about already in Matthew 6, we read this. Jesus says, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, th this prayer we might call an alignment prayer. There's nothing in this prayer um, that God has not explicitly told us, explicitly promised, that will come to pass already. There's no question that the Father's name will be glorified. There's no question that God's will will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. There's no question that God will give us our daily bread. There's no question that He will forgive us as we forgive others. There's no question that He will not lead us into temptation, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man. And there's no question that His will be the kingdom. So this prayer is not explicitly saying, God, these are things that may not happen and we want them to happen. It, the, the point of this is for us to be aligning our will with Christ. And so as we align with Him, those provisions which were already made can be brought close to home. Those things which God, in other words, it's God saying, it's us saying, God, we're going to get on the boat and so we can be co-recipients in your glory. We, you've already Already made provision for our daily bread because you've promised us having food and raiment let, 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 us there, let us there with be content that we don't need to worry about those things and if you promised us that we don't have to worry about it well then if I get on that that bandwagon then I won't have to worry about it so the prayer is me aligning myself with the will of the Father to say God you've promised to provide so I'm going to trust you instead of like the Gentiles seek laboring and, 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 and scattering throughout the earth trying to constantly be be gaining that which God has already said is, is ours if we'll just trust Him. So the fact that these things are, are promised, are, are the provision is made, does not mean that we will be recipients of them all. But if we align ourselves with Christ, Christ says, then, then they are yours. And so that's what we're doing in this prayer. Aligning with God's will. In order to understand this, think of a child and his parents. There are certain things which are consistently in the parent's will as far as children are concerned. A parent always wants to provide sustenance for his children. But the children must indeed align themselves with the parent's will in order to receive that sustenance. My children know that there are three meals on any given day. And particularly as it relates to that morning meal, my family, without fail, there's breakfast. We have a time of breakfast. There will be breakfast. It's what we do in our household. Yet when morning comes, my children fall into two distinct categories here. There are the ones that are eager for breakfast, and then there are ones that are less eager for breakfast. There are certain ones who want the food before it's arrived, and other ones who, when the food has arrived, they're not quite ready yet. Now, in the former group, the one who wants the food before it arrives is usually my son. My son will come in every day and say something to the effect of, I'm hungry. And whether I'm already down in my office working, he'll come down and say, I'm hungry. Or whether he goes to mama and says, I'm hungry. And each day, it's the same thing. I'm hungry. And we say, well, we'll have breakfast when the family is ready to have breakfast. So he is coming and he is announcing that he wants breakfast. Now, I don't think there's anything in, in my son's mind that actually is, 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 there's a question mark back there that says, will I be fed? Because there's nothing within the, the gamut of the history of our family where he would say, I wonder if, if we're not going to get fed today, right? This is something that he gets every morning. Food comes every morning. Now, he goes down, and if there's any of Irene's Cheerios that are lying on the table or whatnot, he will scavenge to his heart's content until every little bit is off of the table and probably off the floor, too, uh, just to get uh, something in his belly until we can eat breakfast. But he comes and he asks for breakfast knowing and expecting that it is going to come and he simply needs to wait for the will of the Father to give it to him. Then there's the latter group and that's usually comprised of one or more of my older daughters. And those girls will, will be in bed and, or one of them will be in bed and I'll come and I'll say something to the effect of hey, it's breakfast time. I have made this provision for you. The provision is set out. You know it's set out. I have given it to you if you will only accept it. And my particular philosophy is I'm not going to force them to do so. So they lie in bed and I say, it is time for breakfast. And they go, ugh, and they roll over. And I say, well, here's how this works. The provision is prepared. But if you don't align, I don't tell them this exactly explicitly, but if you don't align yourself with the will of the Father and the Father's timing and the Father's gift, then you'll miss out. In other words, if you don't come down now, you don't get breakfast. Right? You come down now or you don't get breakfast. And usually, under the, those, the understanding that the provision has been made, but that the provision must be done according to alignment with the Father's will, they align themselves with their Father's will, and they come down to breakfast. There have been times on occasion where they have not aligned themselves with the Father's will, and even though the provision is there for them, 
They've yielded it. They have forfeited it. That's the idea. I'm not saying that because God's will is in place that it means you will, without fail, get everything that God says here. And that's the point of prayer. You align yourself with the will of the Father. God says, I've got provision for you. Your daily bread is there. If you'll align yourself with me, you'll get it. And you can either align yourself with the Father, or you can roll over and say, ugh. And then you'll miss the provision. Either way, the provision is there. And so this is an alignment prayer. I get down on my knees and I say, God, your name will be sanctified. Your kingdom will come. Your will will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All of these things is me saying, God, your way, your way. You've pr you, you have said that, you, that this is for us, so I'm asking for it. You've said that, that, that this provision is made, so I'm praying for it to be done. I'm aligning myself with it that it might be done in me. I'm not telling you that the prayer has no effect by any means. But when we are called to pray for those things that God has already promised, it is intended that we are praying a prayer to align ourselves with Him. That's the kind of prayer that we'll see here as far as the labors into the harvest. So we'll come back to this in just a moment. But let me just talk about the second category briefly. And I'm stealing a little thunder from Luke 11 because we're going to have a prayer series in Luke 11, uh, which will be a little, bit, a little bit off still as far as timing. But the second category of prayer is prayer for that which we desire. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, we read this. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if a son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask of him. So God has promised us certain things. He's promised us food. He's promised us raiment. And in these things we are called to be content. We are called to ask him and when he asks, when we ask him, he will give it. That, that he has made provision for it. That we align ourselves with him. And that he blesses us. But within the context of contentment, being content with such things as we have, the Bible tells us that we can rightly desire more as long as those desires are submitted to the will of God. So that we read in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. So there are those things that, that God has said, it's yours if you ask for it. And so we ask for it and it's ours. But then there are other things that the Bible doesn't really talk about, right? The Bible doesn't really talk about certain other things. The Bible says, be content with such things as you have. And yet, we have desires. Is it okay to pray for those things? Absolutely it is. The things that we want. Absolutely it is. But as we're praying that prayer, our desire is to find God's desires, right? We are seeking to align ourselves with the Lord still. In order to help you understand this one, let's go back to my daughters. So my daughters get their three meals a day, and uh, usually we would understand them to be meals of, of general sustenance, right? These are the meals that mom and dad have put together in order to give the children what they need, the energy, the, the nutrients and such for them to survive. But then there are other things that our children want. And typically speaking, after every meal, and we've talked about this before, my children will say something to the effect of, Daddy, may I have something sweet? They want a treat. Now, a treat is not in their general dietary plan. It is not something that mom and dad have made general provision saying you can expect that every day you are going to be provided this for your best good. And then if you align yourself with the will of the Father, then you will receive these things. But that doesn't mean I don't want to bless my children. And that doesn't mean they can't ask for the things that they desire. And so my children will ask for the things which they desire. And we've talked about this before, right? At that point, the father goes through a process of evaluation. See, the children know that their father loves them, and so they respectfully ask, may I have something sweet? And I assess the situation as it stands. Did they eat enough lunch? 
Have they had what they need to then be able to give them what they want? Is this going to be okay for them in the current situation? Uh, is it okay for their health right now based upon their, their needs and their health? There are certain things we won't give them because they're sick. There are certain things we won't give them because of timing. How, how have they behaved today? Can I give them this blessing without confirming them in their wrong choices? Or are they going to link this blessing to the fact that, well, even though I did a bunch of bad things today, and I was in my room all day today, and I got three spankings, even though all of that took place, Dad's still going to bless me with this treat, am I going to confirm them in their, wrong, in their bad decisions? And is their request reasonable? So if everything is in line, if they ate enough food and it's not going to spoil their next meal and, and they've been well behaved today and I'm not going to confirm wrong choices and if everything is in place, well then my natural predisposition, my inclination is I want to bless my child. I want to give them that. I want to give them something to make them happy. I delight in giving them what they desire. Now, I at no point promise them these extra blessings and gifts but I delight in giving them the desires of their heart as they align themselves with Daddy. My expectations. And as their lives are in a place where that's reasonable. And when they ask, regardless of the answer they get, whether I say yes or whether I say no, if they love and trust their father, then they will know that the decision that I made for them is the one that I believe is best for them. And so they'll be content even if the answer is no. They won't fuss. They won't complain. They won't whine. I'm not saying they don't. I'm saying in the ideal world, right? They won't. And the reason why is because they trust and love their father to do what's best for them. Even when they don't understand or even if it's not exactly what they want, they can say, well, that's not what I wanted, but I know it's what's best. And so I'm going to be content. Because they trust that I know better than they do exactly what they need and what is best for them so that they can even be thankful when I tell them no, because in giving them an answer, they know that I have done what is best. But here's the thing. If they never ask, if they never ask, then they'll never have a chance to receive. Every once in a while, Daddy may decide, you know what, I want to do something nice for my children. I want to bless my children. So I'll call them down and I'll give them a treat. Every once in a while, I might do that. But if they never ask, they'll receive far fewer treats than if they do. So they might as well ask, right? It doesn't hurt anything for them to ask as long as they're in line with my, my, the Father's will, as long as they're not going to fuss and complain and gripe when I don't give them what they want, as long as they're not going to become resentful when Daddy doesn't give them what Daddy doesn't think is best, as long as they love me and trust me enough to say, hey, I might as well ask, and then whatever the father does, whatever daddy does, is what's best for me and I'll trust it, but hey, at least I asked. And then they can start to get a feel for what, what daddy wants, right? And they can start to say, well, last time dad said I couldn't have a treat because I didn't finish dinner. So maybe if I finish dinner this time, then I can have a treat. Last time daddy said that, that it was too close to a meal, so maybe if I ask a little earlier, then I can have a treat. Last time daddy said, no, I couldn't have a treat because I had a bad day and, I, I, and he didn't want to confirm me in my bad decision. So maybe if I have a good day, then I can have a treat. And they begin to align themselves with the will of their father in order that their father can then bless them. Right? Do you see the parallel? Do you see how this works? Do you see what it means that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us, and we know that if He hears us, then we will have those things that we desire? Do you see the idea of ask, seek, knock? If God loves us so much so that He will not give His child a, score, a, a, a rock when He asks for bread, that He won't give him a serpent when He asks for fish, if God delights in giving unto His children good gifts, then we should ask. But we should always ask with a heart of willingness and, and expectation to align ourselves with Him. Right? So that when, when our Father says no, we say, Lord, You love me, and I love You, and I trust You, and so that no is not only me, it's not me losing out on something, it's You giving me what's best. 
but it never hurts to ask as long as our asking is done with complete confidence that God will give us what's best for us. And so we ask, and we either receive or we don't receive. And maybe it's a no, never. Maybe it's a no, this is the wrong timing. Maybe my daughter asks for a treat, and I say, no, you may not have a treat right now. And then 30 minutes or an hour later, I say, okay, now's okay timing. Now you may have your treat. Maybe it's just a timing issue. And in doing so, not only are we, here it is, not only are we receiving the desires of our heart as we ask, but we are also aligning our heart with His so that our desires change to His desires. I'm getting what I, I I'm, I'm seeking what I desire. I know what my Father wants of me. And at some point along the line, if things are going well, those two mesh, right? So that my desires are commingled with my Father's desires for me because I trust Him and I believe He knows what's best for me. And so I get to the point where I say, I don't want it unless Dad wants it for me because Dad knows best. And that's where we come to in our Christian lives, where we have our desires and God has His desires and we pray for our, our desires and God says yes and God says no. And as we see the yeses and the noes, we're drawing nearer to His will as we're submitting ourselves to Him and not becoming resentful and not becoming angry and not saying God's trying to withhold something good for me, but rather saying God is doing what's best for me. And then at some point, I have merged my desires with God's desires so that I want what God wants and I don't want what God doesn't want and then I am a mature Christian. I have reached a level of maturity. Now, where does this fall into the laborers and the harvest? We pray to the Lord of the harvest that He would send forth laborers into His harvest. We don't pray because God doesn't know that there's a need for laborers. We don't pray to see whether or not God wants this because we know He wants this, right? God wants laborers to go into His harvest. But rather, we're praying for access to that provision. God, I know that You have provided, You, you have set aside that You have a desire for laborers to get in Your harvest. This is Your will. Now I'm praying for it for here. Now I'm praying for it for now. And God says, okay, now you can have access to that provision. And so we need to pray for laborers. The degree to which we are faithful to that prayer might very well be a degree to which we can access that provision. We need to be praying that God would equip and call men and women to go into the work of the ministry. We need to be praying that we would be busy about the work in this area. This is a duty of Christ's church to petition the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. Now, as a church, we're working on this. I've started adding it to my weekly prayer, and we need to be working on this more, that we would be faithful to pray for laborers because Christ commands us to. But, you know, there's a really interesting side effect, as I mentioned. We're praying for laborers, right? And this is God's design. God likes, wants laborers. And we're praying for it, and we're melding our heart with God's heart. And as so, our desires become His desires. We talked about that. And could this not be what Psalm 37.4 means when the psalmist writes, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart? Could it be that this is not just saying, if you delight yourself in God, He'll give you what your heart wants, but rather if you delight yourself in God, He will give you your heart's wants? He will... He will make what your heart wants aligned with his, what His heart wants. And it will change our heart to want what God wants as we pray for the things that He's called us to pray for. And so, as we pray this prayer, something interesting might, be, might happen. Don't be surprised if as you pray the prayer for God to send forth laborers into His harvest, that you become a part of His answer. Right? That as your heart conforms to God's heart, as your desires conform to God's desires, that you will receive an aching desire to tell others of the gospel of Christ. And that's a good thing. And that leads us to our second point. The fields are white. The laborers are few. Will you go, knowing the cost of the labor? Will you be the one that goes? I'm not saying implicitly go to the other side of the world. I'm saying, will you go? Will you go to your neighbors? Will you go to your friends? Will you go to your co-workers? Will you go 
to your acquaintances? Will you go to your family? Will you be the one that goes? Will you be the one that instead of just praying, hey, Lord, would you send someone to talk to so-and-so for me? What, 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 if, what if you're that someone? Are you willing to be that someone? Take note of what we find in Luke 9 and 10. I mentioned it earlier. Jesus is calling upon them to pray for the, for, for the Lord to send forth labors into his harvest. But who is he telling to pray? He's telling the people that are already going. He's telling the people that have already been commissioned. He's telling the people who have already yielded themselves to, to share the gospel. Now, there are people who are gifted evangelists. They are given the spiritual gift of evangelism. They have the ability to express the gospel in a special way, and they have an unusually high calling upon their lives to do so. But evangelism is the privilege and opportunity of every believer in Christ. Make no mistake. And if I could just kind of boil it down for us, let me ask you this question, and that's one that I've asked before. What is our point of being here if not to tell others of Christ? What is the functional point of being a follower of Christ if, it, if, if there's no expectation of multiplication? Is it really just for us to become personally better? Is that really why, why Christ saved us? Is the point of being a Christian really just so that I look more like Jesus and that's it? What's the point of Jesus' three years of ministry? If he just came to die, and please don't get me wrong, I know that he came to die. I'm not attempting to minimize his atonement. But if he just came to die, then why didn't he just die? Why did he spend the first three years announcing the gospel to all who would hear? Well, he did so because the point of the gospel is to save those who will believe it. And in order for people to believe it, they need to hear it. So let's take the next step. Why did Jesus choose 12 apostles. He chose the 12 to carry on his teaching after he left. Why did Jesus commission the 70? He commissioned the 70 to go to places that he could not and to give the gospel to those who would hear. He did so because the fields were white unto harvest, but there was not enough people to reap it. So Jesus taught men and prepared them for that purpose of spreading the gospel. And they would spread it to people, and then they would teach those people how to spread it to the next people. And then they would teach it to people to spread it to the next people. And that is how the world is reached. Don't just leave this, this, this hierarchy of telling people, and then they tell people, and they tell people. Don't just leave that to vacuum salesmen and essential oils people. We've got an opportunity here, right? We've got an opportunity to tell others and then to encourage them to tell others and then to encourage them to tell others. That's an opportunity. That's the point. That's why we're here. This is what Jesus Christ has set up. This is why we exist. It's the commission he gave, the very last commission he gave before he ascended. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is what Paul reasoned in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That doesn't mean a pastor. That means a proclaimer. Someone to tell them. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God has... <laughs> Excuse me. God has called some to dedicate their whole lives to the spreading of the gospel. He does not call you to do that. If you have not been called to, to be the, the pastor, the evangelist, then, then, then your whole life is not dedicated to this. You've got other things that you're doing, and, and, and that's okay. That's right. But he does ask you to be a light in the darkness. He does ask you to be a voice in the silence. You have a life to live, and that life is full of unbelievers who may never have the chance to interact with an evangelist or with a preacher, pastor. And yet you're there. 
You are light in that darkness. You can be something to them. Peter said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. What's the point? He's writing to the, the Jews scattered abroad throughout the Roman Empire. And he says, you are a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. For what purpose? That, he says, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have become a part of his light. You've moved into his light so that you can shine the light into the darkness. And so Jesus told the disciples in John 4, after talking to the Samaritan woman, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Here's the other thing about reaping. Here's the other thing about going out into the world and sharing the gospel. There's reward. There's reward. Can you, do, do you have enough faith to believe that? Do you have enough faith to believe that if you will just share the gospel in whatever way you can? Do you have enough faith to believe that if you will just do your part, if you'll just do what you can, and don't be surprised if the Lord gives you more as you, as you do more, but do you have enough faith to believe that if you do that, that there are rewards for you for doing so? And that it'll be worth it. Far worth it. But be warned. You're going out as a lamb in the midst of wolves. It is a dark and evil world out there and they hate Christ. And we are Christians. So we heed the words of John in 1 John 3.13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We're going to talk more about rejection this evening. That'll be our focus. Those that reject. But don't be surprised if you as a sheep of the flock of God go out into the fields of labor and the wolves want to tear you to shreds. A part of laboring in the fields is understanding that the way of life is narrow and that few there be that find it. A part of laboring in the field is understanding that Jesus spent three years primarily in and around Capernaum healing the blind and the sick and the lame, casting out demons, raising people from the dead. And at the end of this, what does he say but... And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shalt be thrust down into hell. The city had by and large rejected him, even though he was there doing marvelous works. And so Jesus says in John 15, verses 18 to 27, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. So Jesus speaks specifically to the disciples here and he says, you've been with me from the beginning. You will bear witness of the, this same hatred. They hated me, Jesus says, so don't be surprised when they hate you. As a matter of fact, while you don't want it, in one sense, to feel the scorn from the unbeliever for the truth and love, not because you're unkind, not because you're obnoxious, not because you're overly aggressive and unreasonable and hateful, but when you feel the scorn from an unbeliever because of you sharing the truth in love, it gets you about as near to your Savior as you can be absent martyrdom, huh? If they hear you, it's because they've heard Christ. If they reject you, it's because they've rejected Christ. Again, we'll talk more about that this evening. But in other words, the point is this. It isn't about you. It's about Christ. So you and I have been gloriously saved from our sin. We have been redeemed. Someone told us. Someone took the time to reach us. Someone took the time to 
give us the gospel. Or maybe not. Maybe you overheard it. Someone was tell, taking the time to tell someone else. Somehow, somebody was putting the gospel out where others could hear it, and you heard it, and you received it. Pass it on. But they're going to make fun of me. But they're going to scorn me. But I might lose, uh, it might get awkward. I might lose uh, an element of relationship. So was Christ before you. So are the apostles. So are the early Christians. So are the martyrs through every century. They, short, they shared the gospel. Things got strange. Things got awkward. Things got deadly. But they shared the gospel. Because that's what we're here to do. If we don't share the truth, who will? The cults are busy. They're out there all the time. They're knocking on doors. They're handing out literature. They're busy making followers who they can make ten times more of the children of hell than they. All the time they're out there, aren't they? We've seen them. Where's the, where's the voice of dissent? If they're the only ones out there, who's going to get reached? One more important point. The fields aren't white everywhere, but there's still so much work to be done. Jesus said, look at the fields there, white under harvest. He saw harvest fields, and as we look into the, the Gospel of Acts, we see that those fields were very much, uh, the, the book of Acts, excuse me, we see that the fields were very much white under harvest. The number of people accepting Christ as the Spirit of God was doing His work. But, you know, the fields aren't white everywhere. There are places where other work needs to be done. There are places where there's some grains here and there, but you know, the fields are still kind of rocky. The soil is not quite prepared. The seeds haven't fully been sown. And so maybe in Buffalo, maybe in Buffalo the fields aren't quite as white under harvest as we would want them to be. Maybe in Rockford, in St. Michael, in Waverly, and in Annandale, and in Rogers and Hibbing, maybe, maybe the fields aren't quite as, as, as white under harvest. Maybe there's so many weeds in the field that the grain can't really sprout, that they're being choked out by the weeds of false teaching and false doctrine. Maybe those weeds need to be pulled, and maybe that's where the time needs to be spent first, pulling a bunch of weeds, correcting people's false doctrines, Helping people, guiding them into truth, guiding them to correction of their errors. Maybe there's a bunch of rocks and the, the field just needs to be torn up, tilled, plowed, and planted. And we've just got to start from the beginning with folks. Maybe you can't just step out these doors, <coughs> meet a person, and say, hey, this is the gospel. And they say, all right, let's do this. Maybe it's going to take several months of sitting down with them and opening a Bible and saying, hey, can we walk through this together? Let's do a Wednesday night Bible study. Let's do a Wednesday night Bible study and we'll just walk through John and we'll, we'll talk through it. But you know what that means? That means Wednesday nights. That means time. That means you have to do some study so that when they ask you questions, you can either say, yep, that's the answer, or you can say, I don't know it, but I'm going to find it for you. And then you get them through the entire gospel and you lead them to the place where they say, I know what I need. And then that's all you can do, right? The rest is up to the Lord. And whether or not they will volitionally choose to accept it. But will you get them to that point? Will you do the work? It's labor. It is work. But here's the thing. The laborer receives his wages. And the sower and the reaper will one day rejoice together. Is there something you can do there's so much work to be done. And so as we close today, the question is simple. Are you about the work of the gospel? Are you about the work? In just a couple of weeks, probably three weeks, we're going to start a Sunday school time where we're going to re reinvigorate our understanding of evangelism. We're going to talk about evangelism, how to do it. 
We had an evangelism conference with a missionary last year. We've talked about these things and we'll continue to do so. Are you, are you learning how to share the gospel? If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you have what's necessary to share it, right? You know what's needed. You know that you have to know you're a sinner, that you have to understand that Jesus is God, that He came, that He died on the cross, that He rose again the third day, that He did that as the substitutionary atonement for our sins, that He did what we could not do, that He offers the gift freely. You can say that. You can open the Bible to John 3 and talk them through Jesus with Nicodemus. You can give them a gospel tract and say, here, read this. Somebody that's a lot more eloquent than me wrote something that you need to read. Are you doing something? Are you laboring? Are you praying for laborers? Do you do this as a family? Individually? Lord, would you send forth laborers into your harvest? Father, would you send someone to my family? Would you send someone to my friends? Would you send someone to my coworkers? Would you, would you give me an open door? Are you willing to be a laborer? Have you accepted the cost that comes with laboring? Are you ready to do what is necessary to reveal the gospel to others? It's not up to you who accepts it and rejects it. We'll talk about that more tonight. But by God's grace, may we be able to say of everyone in Buffalo that the kingdom of God came nigh unto them through the ministry of Legacy Baptist Church. Let's close in prayer.